Amen. Good morning. Good morning. How are you? Would you just do that? Would you just hold your hands in front of you this morning? Michelle, would you join me up here? And just hold, let, let, let me sing that song. In fact, I wonder if we could just do that last course again after we pray. I want us just to this morning submit ourselves to the fullness of all it is that God wants to accomplish in us this morning. Lord, my heart is open. My heart is free. I hold my hands before you, Lord, in a posture this morning of submission to your will a submission to your purposes and your favor, being released in fullness in my life in Jesus' name. Today I come, Father, to the altar. And, and Father, I come with an expectation that that is exactly what will occur in my life today. My life today, come on, say this in your heart, my life today will be altered. I'm about to be altered by Holy Spirit in this place. And so I open all that I am to you today. And I thank you for your goodness among us in Jesus' name. And everyone said amen. 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 We are so glad you're here today. Amen. We are glad you're here today. And especially if you are a guest with us this morning, we are super, super glad that you are here. And we would love the opportunity to connect with you beyond this morning. So we just invite you to fill out what's called the blue card. And you can find it in one of those seat pockets in front of you in your row. Um, you can also find them at any of our info counters here in the lobby and also here in the commons. And just fill that out and put it in one of our black giving boxes and that will just give us an opportunity to connect with you, to give you a little gift, to tell you a little bit more about who we are as a church and the things that God has called us to. So we just want to say welcome to all the guests in the house. Come on, amen. Yeah. We are going to transition here and make an announcement. In just a second, I'm going to have you to be seated, but I just have to kind of release this word. Because as, even as you were talking, I felt like the Lord said to me that there are a particular person, maybe persons this morning, that you've brought some brokenness with you today. And you are grieving over some things that have been broken in your life. And I clearly heard the Lord say, raise their expectation by telling them, you will leave here today restored, and you will see the manifestation of that restoration come on you receive that say amen amen go ahead and give somebody a fist bump and tell them you're in the right place at the right time and you may be seated okay you may be seated I am I just can't tell you how excited I am about what God is doing at our school Quad City Christian it has been a two-year whirlwind tour when we brought Mr. Jeremy Steiner and Michael uh, from South Africa. They came in here. As we were talking with the board, we told them, we're not just going to hire just another principal. We're going to hire a man of God who has a vision, who has a passion, and who has an ability to turn this school in a solid, positive direction. And I just want to report to you today that we have seen God do exactly that. It has been amazing. And I have to tell you, the future of Quad City Christian School is in really good hands and is brighter than ever, even in the face of the COVID. In fact, I never say the COVID without rebuking the COVID in Jesus' name. Welcome, Mr. Steiner. Amen. Thank you, Pastor. Well, I just wanted to come before you this morning and tell you we are open. And, uh, you know, exactly. Five days a week, full time. We're going to have all the kids back. We're going to be taking, you know, safety measures. Uh, we are requiring every single child to wear a mask, but I'm giving the parents the opportunity to consent if they feel like their child has some of the issues that the ISBE has listed out. But I just want to tell you guys, I want to come before you to tell you about the school, but tell you, man, this summer has been crazy. And right now, I feel the weight. My staff feels the weight of what we're going into. 
And really, if I could ask the body just to be lifting up our school, to be praying for us, I'm facing opposition all the time. Of course, I was on the news a couple days ago. I'm getting feedback on both sides of the fence of what we're doing and why we're doing and what's right and what's wrong. But man, I just feel burning inside of me that I know that we are supposed to stay open, that we are supposed to stay strong, that we are supposed to be a light. We are going to be a hope for children, and we are going to raise them up in the ways of the Lord. And I want all of those people that are sitting at home that you may know that say, financially, I can't choose a private education. I want you to tell them to reach out to me because my doors are wide open, and I'm going to accept all these kids. I'm going to, I'm going to give financial aid left and right because I believe that now is the time for the school to rise up. Now is the time for us to be a beacon of hope for all those that are gonna be sitting at home or two days a week. And I'm not knocking anybody's plan, but I know that I've gone before the Father and He's given me a plan and I'm gonna take that plan as far as it goes no matter what opposition I face. So I'm just here to tell you the school is open and I wanna welcome you if you know anybody that doesn't agree with their public school plan Tell them to enroll. Tell them to apply. It's very easy. You go to qcchristianschools.org. They're working on the graphic. I'll get it up, but it'll be on the website as well. Or they can call us at 309-762-3800. But I'll be around to give you that information. But if you feel like you know someone that needs to be a part of our school, I want you to come find me. And again, I want you to lift up our school in prayer as we begin to open next week on the 19th for our first half day. Amen? Are you with me, church? Come on. Come on, would you stand with us again? We're gonna we're gonna do some bits of this song again. We know it's new and sometimes it's hard to kind of grab a hold of it right away at the very beginning. But Sally, can you just put those lyric court the lyrics up for the bridge? Just this morning feeling such a I didn't know if it was just me personally, just kind of feeling heavy and not really knowing what to how to put your finger on exactly what's making you feel that way. Uh, but this this bridge says till all that overwhelms anybody feel overwhelmed with all the stuff around you can watch the news you can all the decisions our school districts are having to make and mamas and dads are having to make for their children and for school and our principals and all of these things till all that overwhelms is what is overwhelmed by you that we come and we sing that chorus that says, my hands are open and my heart is free. Come invade <laughs> everything. Come invade my mind and my heart. God, come invade our world. Come invade our nation. And everything that overwhelms us, God, let it be overwhelmed by you and who you are, your love and your grace and your mercy, your healing touch. So as we sing this again this morning, just have those things in your mind. Come on, let's do, let's do some warfare this morning with our praise. Let's intercede not only for ourselves, but let's intercede for our nation, that the, God's kingdom would come and his will would be done on this earth. Amen? Come on, Tim. Sing, I want to come. I want to come to you in boldness By your power I receive And I want to live in expectation With you I'll do greater things
count one thing The same God that never fails Will not fail me now He won't fail me now In the waiting The same God who's never late Is working all things out He's working all This morning, I'm just so, so, so delighted to uh, let you know we have Dr. Patty Amsden and her husband, Dennis, are with us, and uh, I have thoroughly enjoyed, in fact, I, it's probably been a couple of years ago, uh, uh, maybe, maybe two and a half years ago, we had a gathering in here of, of intercessors on a Sunday night, and this little lady walks in, and she, she came in late. And so we're already well into our thing. She came, she took a seat, and there were several prophecies throughout the evening. And then at the end of it, I watched her get up. I had absolutely no clue who she was, had never seen her. And she began to weave together this thread of all of these prophecies and what it is that the Lord was saying to us as a body and, and also to us as a region, as a part of the ecclesia and the governing body of Christ. And so I'm thinking, whoa. Who is this? And so afterwards, I met her, talked to her, uh, read uh, some of her books, and just absolutely have been blessed, I mean, to sit under her teaching, to sit under her anointing. And uh, since that meeting, she has been, other than Dutch, Sheets, she has been the one person that has continually returned more than anybody else. And it's because the depth of the river of God that flows into her is something that I want to just splash out all over our body. And so today I'm delighted, delighted, delighted to welcome to our pulpit Dr. Patty Amsden. Would you welcome her this morning?
Those were very kind words. I actually wrote that script for him. I, there were, I did notice there were several paragraphs that he left out. So we're going to talk in the break so he gets it right the next time. We, um, one of my first times here uh, in a broader uh, setting where uh, Pastor had invited me to come and to speak was in one of your Azusa uh, meetings. And so um, he was tired to put together a conference like that, you know, and all that it takes to uh, bring in the speakers and set it all up. And so the meetings were long and wonderful, and the anointing was there, and the power was there, and, and, but he was tired. And, and so he was uh, not knowing for sure what the next years would hold. And I remember getting up here, and, you know, I got this word I need to deliver, but kind of felt my knees going, oh, my, Pastor Scott, I have to tell you that you got to do another Azusa. Do you remember that? So this is how prophetic I am. I just, you know, he had it planned and COVID hit. And so he called me and said, we're not going to do the Azusa you prophesied over. So I didn't know if that went, I'm not big enough to prophesy and take down COVID, or I don't know what that meant, but someday we will do another Azusa, amen. God bless you all. It's wonderful to uh, be here. I'm, I know you've been finding God during these days, right? In new ways, there's new, uh, new ways that hit our lives, give us an opportunity to meet something about the Lord that maybe we hadn't met before. Um, I was sitting down there, and I heard the Holy Spirit say, uh, Patty, I always keep the vigil. And when he said that, it just kind of came in my heart, what a good word, you know? He's watching when I'm asleep. He's watching when it's light outside. He's watching when it's a dark night of the soul. He's watching when I have nothing but questions. Sometimes when I have, I'm just so full and everything is so good, I'm not paying any attention to him because life is so wonderful. But he never varies from that, does he? He's always watching. So I just want to deliver that word to you today. God is watching. He's keeping the vigil for you and over you. You're scripted in the palm of his hand, and he has you ever before his heart and uh, on his heart and before his eyes. So just when, you know, uh, when you wonder where he is, he's got you. He's got you. Amen? Amen. Well, today we're going to talk out of the book of James. So if you have your Bibles, those of you that still carry the big books... Uh, can open there are if you have if you have the little palm uh, you can open your um, palm pilot or whatever but if you'd like to read along with me I'm going to read out of the first chapter of the book of James um, James is a, a book on wisdom and that's what we're going to talk about today we're going to talk about wisdom so I'm going to read just portions I'm, I, I, um, Boy, we could just read the whole book, and that would be a good church service right there. But um, let's, let's just read a few passages found in the book of James. I'm going to read first off verses 1 through 4. Uh, James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes that are scattered abroad, greeting. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations. And this is about the time where, where you say to yourself, oh my. What's she going to say? This is not the passage I was hoping to hear when I came to church about tests and trials. All right, so everybody go, oh, my. Then say to yourself, it's going to be okay. All right, so, brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith works patience, and let patience have her perfect work, that you may be perfect and entire wanting nothing. Let's drop over to verse 13. But don't let any man say when he's tempted that I'm tempted of God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempts he any man. But every man is tempted when he's drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Now the, the message has just even gone a level lower. Now I'm talking about temptation. Everybody say it's going to be okay. <laughs> For when lust has conceived, it brings forth sin, and when sin is finished, it brings forth death. Don't err, my beloved brother. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. And then I'm just going to read the last, uh, a few more verses, verses 22 through 25. Be ye therefore doers of the word 
and not hearers only deceiving your own selves. For if any man be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he's like a man who looks, beholds his natural face in a mirror in a glass, and for he beholds himself, and then he goes away and straightway forgets what manner of man he was. But whosoever looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. Father, I thank you for your word. Lord, we honor we honor your scriptures. We honor the spirit of God who brings to life those scriptures. We honor the assembly of the saints where the word is taught, where the word is sung, where the word is communicated. We honor everything, Father, about your kingdom and how you implement that kingdom in our life. I pray that your spirit will rest so strongly upon this message and upon our words that we will be made alive in your word this day in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, the book of James is categorized as a, a book, as wisdom literature. Uh, so it's written like in the epistles, meaning in the letters. But of all of the letters that you find in the New Testament, there's more like proverb kind of wisdom in the book of James than in all the other epistles together. So the, uh, the theologians categorize, categorize it like the book of Proverbs. It's filled with all this wisdom. So the focus here is going to be on wisdom. And uh, I was thinking the other day, I had an amazing opportunity. You're going to love how I use the word opportunity. When you don't know what else to call something, that's a good word for it. I had an amazing opportunity. Uh, we have five children, and uh, we're grateful to the Lord that uh, we live through it. And uh, they did too, but I tell you, I wasn't as worried about them as us. But we made it. We made it through. They're all grown. They're out of the house. And they have children of their own. And uh, our fourth born is a son named David. And he's the pastor of the church that Dennis and I, uh, that Dennis began a number of years ago. And uh, he, pa David, Pastor David's now our pastor. I always say he's, he's my pastor unless I need to be his mother. But other... <laughs> <laughs> but uh, anyway, they have four children, and they've been married 15 years, and they decided to do this adult getaway. They were going uh, with, four, I think, three or four other uh, couples, and they were going to go to Florida and just get away. 15 years, the first time for that to happen. And I was saying, oh, honey, that's just awesome. Go have fun. He said, yeah, Mom, will you watch the kids? <laughs> so an opportunity arose to... Uh, Four grandbabies, of course, they had to book the flight early in the morning, which means they had to get the kids up before they would normally get up and get them dressed and get them out of the house without any breakfast so they could get to grandma's in a great frame of reference, frame of mind, right? Hungry and amped, amped, ready to run to do this and run to do that. Six o'clock in the morning, slow down, kids, I'm just barely up. So they walk in the door, and... Um, I was thrust back into parenting in one, um, like, back to the future moment. It was like I got in my DeLorean and boom, I'm back to parenting. And uh, so we, had, we did have this wonderful time. They, they got everything they wanted. I, ref <laughs> I refused to say no. Uh, I, what would you like me to cook? My, my, my grandson said, Nana, fix me chicken and dumplings. And I wanted to say, you know, that's a four-hour project. I said, okay, Judah, you want your, it's your birthday, chicken and dumplings. I'm in there, flour everywhere, making chicken and dumplings for my kids. It's a wonderful experience, but here's something that happened. I remembered how children aren't mature. <laughs> I, I, I remembered how they're not growing up. And one thing that totally caught my attention is they have this ability to take their clothes off <laughs> and leave them where they drop them. They, and you want to say to yourself, you could pick those up. You could turn them right side, you know, inside out. They're inside out, turn them right side out, or however you say that. Put them in your, put them near your suitcase. I understand you don't have a closet at my house, but put them near your suitcase. No, I'd walk in the bathroom, in the bedroom. M Mariah, the little girl, she got so excited about going swimming, she dropped her clothes in the foyer and ran to find her swimming suit. So I would walk around my house droppings of clothing from four children everywhere. And I said to myself, somebody has taught children that there is magic 
It's just in here. I mean, there's an Easter Bunny, and there's a Santa Claus, and there's a clothes fairy. <laughs> and they think that someone will come along and wave a magic wand, and those clothes will disappear, and they reappear clean and hanging in their closet. And children just automatically think that's how this works. They're born with that understanding. To, uh, not, not to fairy, a clothes fairy will follow after me. And I did not prove them wrong. I figured that was something that their parents could teach them. But being thrust back into my yesteryear, I remember saying to myself at for every child, I did this for all five, I'm no respecter of persons. Every one of those children, there, there came a time where I said, you are now maturing to the point that you can learn to pick up your own clothes. And this was an amazing day at our house when I would begin to say, this is how we pick up clothes. We bend our back. We take our hands. See, this is called picked up. Oh, that was so much fun. They pick up their clothes. Now we're going to take them over here. We're going to put them in the dirty clothes. I taught them, I, they, every child, I told them what to do. I came in, I said to my husband, I'm just the best mom ever. I just taught our children how to pick up their clothes. And I felt so good about myself all that night until the next morning I went in and they had dropped their pajamas to find their clothes. And I said, I'm the worst mom ever. I can't even teach my kids to pick up their clothes. And I discovered something. That to train a child in wisdom takes more than one time, right? It takes, let me teach you, let me tell you, let me show you, let me walk it through. Oh, again, let me teach you, let me show you, let me walk it through. And then, then one day, someday, it dawns on them and they become an expert clothes picker-upper. You walk in their room and they have made the information part of their daily processes, and they can pick up their own clothes. And I'm telling you what, life gets easier, right? It gets extra easier when they can drive themselves to all the soccer games. But apart from that, when they can pick up their clothes. So I'm watching my grandchildren, and I thought, you guys need some maturity. You need some wisdom. I'm not going to be your teacher. I'm going to be your enabler to stay unwise. I'm going to take care of you because I'm sending you home and mom and dad can teach you those necessities of life. <clears throat> so uh, I was thinking about how wisdom, uh, you, go, you go through a process to get there. It doesn't just drop. It isn't a one-time hearing. You have to move into it and you have to practice what you are learning so that you can become walking wisdom. Can I say it that way? So uh, uh, since James is this book about wisdom, and since I just had this experience, I looked up the definition of wisdom. And according, this is just dictionary.com. Uh, even though she carries a big old Bible, she does know how to use a computer. So uh, I did go on and uh, uh, look up dictionary.com. It says, knowledge, uh, uh, wisdom is knowledge of what is true and right, coupled with just judgment as to action. Meaning, it's what you know and what you're able to do with what you know. That's how, we, it's, it's not just information, but it's the application of that information at the right time that gives you wisdom. Now, in Scripture, adds a little uh, broader context to that. Scripture says, the fear of the Lord, you know this passage, is the beginning of wisdom. And knowledge of the Holy One is insight. That's Proverbs 9 and 10. So what you know, ba it needs to be first based on not what you've learned out here, but based on what God has said. The beginning of wisdom is the knowledge of God. So first of all, what does God have to say about anything? We understand that the heavens were first, that the eternal is more realm than the natural. Uh, the eternal is more real. That realm is more real than the natural. So wisdom starts with reverence and honor that this is the realm of all truth and knowledge and understanding. And we first have to get our knowledge from here here and then work that knowledge or live that knowledge out. So if you put those two kind of definitions together, uh, it's the thoughts, the words, the deeds that reflect the heart, the mind, and the will of God. You're, I know you're wanting to know where I got that definition. No reliable place it came from me. But uh, <laughs> So wisdom is the thoughts, the words, and deeds that reflect the heart, the mind, and the will of God. It's knowing and doing the, the will of God. Everybody say knowing and doing. 
So uh, uh, with my grandchildren and with my own children, I was not content that they just heard my information. I wanted to see it put into application. And actually, wisdom for children, or for any of us, you grow in the next stage of who you are because you gain knowledge and you've learned to apply it. And then once you've learned to apply it, you conquer that realm You've matured into that realm, and then there's something else to know and to learn and to apply. And maturity is the process of moving through knowing and doing. Wouldn't you say that's true? Uh, so this idea of uh, maturation or this idea of growing, of growing in wisdom has the goal of becoming perfect. Everybody say perfect. All right, so perfect, by that I don't mean flawless, like without a defect, Although, let me just say to you, the closer you come to the application of wisdom, the less flaws you're going to have in what you're doing. Can you hear that? The closer you become, or you move into the application of wisdom, the less flaws you have. So, it, it, perfect is a good way of describing wisdom. It's the application of what you know, uh, attaining to a fuller and fuller and fuller application of what you know. For example, how many of you would like to go to a doctor, and he'd have on his wall uh, about 76% perfect? Uh, is there option number two? Oh, I'd like to go. I'd like to go to a doctor whose rate is a little more perfect than right. I'd like. I'd like a doctor who takes the wisdom that he has and can apply it with less and less flaws. It's heart surgery. I'm just saying. You know, I'd like to have higher level of perfection. Right. So I, I'm just saying that. Don't be afraid of the word perfect because James is going to use this word seven times, and the, and he's using it to say we're supposed to come all the way to where we can live out what it is that we know. So this word perfect actually is the way James uses it. He uses it in a uh, the Greek word is teleos, and it just means this. It's the point aimed at. For example, you know the word telephone. So the front part of the word telephone is that part of that word teleos. So telephone is to speak far off. Where are you aiming to talk? Well, the telephone will take you there. Telescope, where are you aiming to see? Tele or telegraph, we don't use those anymore, but you watch a cowboy movie, so you probably know what those are, right? When they used to write far off. That's this idea that uh, wisdom has a goal out there, and that's to take you to where wisdom should take you, where you more frequently do it right than do it wrong. Anybody afraid of the word perfect there? No, it isn't about, oh my gosh, God won't love me if I don't do it perfectly. No, he loves you enough to help you get it right more often than you get it wrong. He's in the process of moving you into that uh, type of application of wisdom. So the meaning of perfect, I'm going to say it this way, it means um, mature, whole, living a completely integrated life. So if you're taking notes, I think that's a good definition of maturity, or wisdom, I mean. Uh, maturity, wholeness, living a completely integrated life. So the goal of wisdom is to cause us to not only know, but to do. To more consistently do what we know. To be integrated between what we say and what we live. I like to call it this way. You become the walking word. Another way I like to call, say it is you become the word incarnated. You know what incarnation means? It's inside, right? So for me raising my children, I wasn't content that they could repeat to me how to pick up their clothes. I wanted that word incarnated. And when they could incarnate that instruction, they grew in an aspect of wisdom. Is it that is this early morning on Sunday and you're like, would she just stop talking? Are you following me? You following me? Okay. So you need to be incarnated. What you hear needs to be so worked into who you are that you are a doer of the word. You are the word incarnated. So that's this idea of James and some of the passages that we read. I'm going to look at uh, James 1, uh, verses 2 through 4 just for a minute and break down some of those words for you. James says, my brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations. Now, he's not saying temptations are a joyful thing. But he's saying reckon it this way. Reckon it as joy. 
reckon it, consider it, because you're about to enter into a process by where you can become the Word incarnate. You're about to enter into a process where not only what you hear, but what you do, uh, it becomes integrated. And you're going to grow up. You're going to be mature. How many would rather be mature than a baby? I mean, I looked at the kids, and I think, I'll be glad when you're mature, right? Not, but now I just send them home to their, grand, their parents, you know, and say, don't call me with your problems. And then he goes on to say, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations, knowing that the testing of your faith is going to work patience, and let patience have her perfect, that's your word, teleos, have it, the point aimed at, patience has a point aimed at, and what is that point aimed at? That you may be fully mature, wanting nothing. So life, and God is structuring stuff to teach you and move you into the application so that you can do what it is you know. I mean, think that sounds like a pretty good plan, right? So um, uh, he, uh, he does, though, he says, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations. I'm going to give you three English words to kind of describe that one Greek word of temptations. And these are the three words we're going to kind of look. It'll, I think it'll help us to understand what uh, James is saying here. Uh, we're going to look at the word tests. We're going to look at the word trials, and then we're going to look at the word temptations. And all three of those words kind of help us to see more what James is trying to talk about, uh, this process that matures us. Think about tests like you would think about being back in school, or maybe you're still in school, and the teacher says it's test day, and there's all these questions to try to help you discover what it is you know. How well have you learned the facts, right? So you take a test to be able to say what it is you know. Um, uh, this is called the testing or the proving of our faith. Well, here's the thing. We come to God and we know stuff here in this natural realm, but we don't necessarily know stuff in that spirit realm. So we begin to get a download of facts of what God is and who God is and what he's able to do and what his will is. And we, we, that, that's the very first thing. You have to have somebody teach you what you didn't know. They have to, you have to teach the kids how to pick up their clothes. Otherwise, they believe, you know, in the fairy, right? So you teach them. God comes to teach us eternal truths out of the unseen realm. We don't know who he is. We'd like to make a God after our own image that serves us best. But nonetheless, he is who he says he is. And we have to learn about him. We have to learn about his ways. We have to learn about his promises. We have to understand those things. And so the first thing that happens is tests will come along and we get to see if we can figure out God will do this. God won't do this. This is who he is. We take the test of our knowledge and uh, it proves how much we've learned and how much we haven't learned. That's, that can happen in life. And, and scripture here in James says, and you know, if you don't know the answer, ask God. And he'll, give it, he'll help to give you the answer without upbraiding you for not knowing, knowing what he is. You, we've come into this kind of um, unaware of the spirit realm, and God begins to teach us. So you take tests. Also, you go through trials. Think about trials like going to a court of law. What happens in a courtroom is they bring forth proof, not of what you know, but of what you've done. Here's the evidence of what you've done. Uh, trials, not they don't they don't show up what we know. They show up what we know. They don't show up what our knowledge is. They show up how much of that knowledge has been incarnated. I can tell you believe that God is the rewarder. I can tell you believe in covenant because you've tied for fifty years. There's my evidence. Put me on trial. I got evidence uh, of you know certain aspects. So test. What you know, trials, what you do. And then the other word there that we said we put in there is the word temptations. And temptations is this, it, it carries, in our English uh, understanding, it carries with it the enticement to do something you ought not to do. That's what temptation does. Uh, and here, we, passage we read, James says, don't even think when that happens that it's God that's ever enticing you to do wrong. You're enticed when there's something internally that has not yet come through a sufficient sanctification so that the lust of the eye, the lust of uh, the pride of life, the lust of the flesh, these things out here can lure Maybe demons help to do that, sometimes evil people, sometimes it's just historical 
patterns in our own life and we get t tested to God. Oh, I want to do that and oh, I need to reach over here. Well, it's a, tr a temptation to prove how much of the word has been incarnated or how much of carnality is still incarnated, right? Can you hear it that way? So the scripture says, don't say when you're, don't say, because you, you can't really talk when that's in there anyway, can you? But don't say that God did that. Because God doesn't tempt us with evil. He cannot be tempted. That isn't the realm in which he works. But let me just say to you, temptations do try your faith. And they reveal what? They reveal if you got any cracks. If you got any lack of integrity. If you got any dr uh, leanings of the inside man. And if you yield to temptations, you created yourself a trial of your own making. Right? But the good news is, whether it's a test, whether it's a trial, whether it's a temptation, God can help provide a way of escape. Because just like with our children, one time one of the kids was over there and I asked them something and I knew, I knew the answer, uh, but they didn't want to act like I knew the answer and they lied to my face. You know, and you go like, you're, you're six. Who taught you to lie? Right? I didn't say, well, it's over for you. You yielded to temptation, you little sinner, you. No, help them maturing into the process. And God is so faithful uh, to help us. Knowing, knowing we've come out of the kingdom of darkness. Knowing we've been driven by that thing. And we've been placed into the kingdom of life for the process of what? Learning and doing. For the process of maturation. For the process of integration. So we can become an incarnated word. Hallelujah. I just preached my whole sermon right there in one concluding sentence. <laughs> Hello. All right. So let's go back, go back to that verse though. He says, uh, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations, knowing that the uh, trying of your faith, the testing of your faith can work patience. Now, patience is another new word. We haven't yet, we've talked about wisdom. We've talked about temptations. Now let's talk about patience. Patience is a fun word that if you see it in the Greek, you kind of understand better what he's, what he's saying because it's often translated endurance or steadfastness. Those are good words words, but in the Greek, it actually is a two-part word, hupomone. Everybody say hupomone. No, you don't. You didn't say that like you cared at all. <laughs> so hupo is the prefix that means under. You know the word hyper, which means over, the condition in which the grandchildren entered the house, hyper. And I wanted to say to them, get hoopo faster, will you? So hoopo means under, and mino is the second part of that word. It, it means uh, to remain, to abide, to stay. So patience means to remain under. Remain under what? Remain under the test. Remain under the pressure of the test. Remain under the trial. Don't go running away from it or trying to throw it off. Stay there under it because the pressure reveals the integrity of what is uh, of your condition, right? The, the pressure shows if there's a crack. It shows if there's a crevice. Now, the, one of the reasons we want to run away is we don't want anybody to know we're not perfect. But remember, perfection is the goal. That's where God is taking us. He's taking us to the place where we can be whole. He's taking us to the place where we can do it right more often than we can do it wrong. He's taking us to the place where we're a reflection of kingdom principles and the word more often than we're a reflection of carnality. So he's got to show up the imperfections, <laughs> you know, so you can know what he's going to work on, right? Show up the flaws and the cracks so the pressure comes. Hupomone, he said. Remain under the pressure and let that have its perfect work in you to take you all the way to maturity. That's, I've noticed over the years when pressures come on people, there's, there's kind of like three categories. And since this is my sermon, we're staying with three. There could be a dozen, but we're staying with three this morning. Uh, one of the first things that seems to be revealed, seems uh, it was so in me, but I watched it in 30-plus years of pastoring, too, that the first thing people say when they get under pressure, and they, they'll say, I wonder if God is even noticing. I wonder if God is watching. I wonder if he even sees where I'm hurting. And they begin to question, we begin to question whether God loves us or not. 
Anybody say, yeah, that's probably true. Let me say, that's the first thing that must get fixed under the pressure of the trial. You have to know that God has shed his love abroad. You can't even begin the process of sanctification if everything brings you back to that same question, I don't even know if I belong. I don't even know if he loves me. So the first thing the pressure can help to uh, perfect in us is this knowledge that we are loved. The second thing that I have noticed is that it, we question whether, if God has said it, if it will really come about. So first we question his, his character as our father. Then we question the veracity of his word. Uh, that's a testing of your faith. God is not a man that he should lie, neither the son of man that he should repent. Has he said, will he not do it? Has he spoken, will he not make it good? Somebody say, you betcha he will. Right? So God is this God of truth. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and life. He speaks, and he watches over his word to perform it. And the second thing that pressure can do is bring us to the place where we know that we know that we know no matter what these circumstances are saying and how much these circumstances are contrary to what he said, it's his word that stands the test. It's his word that's true, and I can rest in that, and I can believe in that, and his word is true in me no matter what the oppression on the outside. So first, that God loves you. Second, that his word is true. And then third, uh, and for just, I mean, I'd like to camp here for three weeks because the essence of what this book of James is, it's about trials that the, the uh, scattered tribes of Israel were undergoing because the faith that they and who they represented in Christ was under persecution. They were being persecuted by religious leaders. Of course, in that day, the Romans were persecuting. There was lots of persecution, and it was for Christ's sake. And may I say to you, this is where we count it all joy. We count it all joy that there is enough of Christ in me, you know, enough of his character and enough of his nature and enough of his purposes that I kind of stand in his stead. And what they would have done to him, they do to those of us who are followers and reflectors of Christ. Count it all joy when you identify with Christ in his suffering. And James here says, for these will receive the crown of life. Paul said, I make up the measure of sufferings in Christ. Timothy uh, said, uh, if, you, if you suffer with him, you'll also be glorified with him. Peter, I mean, the, well, Peter said, don't think it's strange concerning these fiery trials that you'll try you. It's like, wow, what, what? He didn't say what the heck happened, but it's kind of that idea. But know that when we are in Christ and we are so integrated that when we speak, and there's an opposing ideology. There can be persecution. Jesus said it this way. Uh, uh, blessed are you when men shall persecute you and revile you and say all manner of evil against you for my name's sake for such is the kingdom of heaven. This is basically what uh, James is talking about. When you get to this place that the trials have worked this amount of maturity and this amount of sanctification and this amount of integration that you are a reflection of Christ in walking and the demons don't like that and the vain philosophies of the age don't like that and the, uh, you know, you know, and the Systems and you stand for righteousness and they're speaking for the voice of another God and you're persecuted for righteousness sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad. To be so integrated through our trials that we are the word incarnate. That's what is being spoken here. And one of the reasons I wanted to say that to you today, why I wanted to say this message, is I believe we are in an age of persecution for Christ's sake that may be uncommon, would have been uncommon to my mom and dad, would have been uncommon to Dennis and I in our early earlier years. Because listen to this, the more pagan a society becomes, the more persecution there is for righteousness. So the Judeo-Christian foundation of America caused people to be able to live like Christ in the earth without being persecuted for that. But the more pagan our nation becomes, the more those that stand for righteousness are. We may and already are in a window of time where we may have a great opportunity to count it all joy. I've been in nations where I've been asked to leave 
I've been in nations where the pastors were threatened with prison. Uh, I remember saying goodbye to some pastors in China where the communist officials said, you're going to jail. Just, and they got us out of the con country, and those, uh, those pastors were going to jail for their faith. We've not known that in the U.S. You almost had to be on foreign soil. Things have shifted. Can you hear me? Yes. Count it all joy. Now, don't suffer because you're too uh, arrogant to not know when you ought to be quiet. You know, don't make your own, don't make your own, don't, don't, don't have to preach, even though, you know, they're going to hear me and bless God and everybody's mad at you for prayer. Don't, don't make your own issues. The servant of the Lord must not strive, but in meekness and in patience be long-suffering because we don't know if God will pre-adventure give them repentance to the knowledge of truth so we there's times where it's okay to be quiet and you're still a testimony there's a times when you ought to speak and you do it in love and you do it in meekness and you do it in long suffering and there's a time then you just say no like you guys apostles you can't preach in christ's name well whether we obey you or whether we obey god we'll take the beaten and we're going to preach it's time church to be the church it's time to be the light it's time to be the salt. It's time to do it in the right spirit, but nonetheless encourage, not counting it all joy for the sake of the nation round about us, for the sake of the culture round about us, to stand up and let Christianity be the light and be the salt that it was determined to be. Jesus said, if you don't have any salt, you don't have any light, they're just going to trample on you. Well, how many of you know we've been walked on? You know what I found that's happening and COVID's been a chance to see that. The church is rising up. And I'm saying rise up, church. Stand underneath the pressure. And be the light and be the truth that we're supposed to be. So I just pray, and uh, I pray for you to have grace to endure and patience to stand. I pray that any place where you find a flaw, you will look into the word of God because James said, look into that perfect law of liberty. I pray that you'll go to look in and then go out and practice. Go to look in and go out and practice until you become the word incarnate. Until you know that you're loved unconditionally and you never question that again. Until you know that you know that God's word is true and you don't question that again. And then that God can send you into those pockets in the culture in which you live to be the light that you you need to be not being afraid that you might be persecuted because you count it joy to identify with his suffering that the truth of the glory of the Lord can be, you know, presented to a lost and dying people. Amen? Amen. If you believe that God will grace you to stand in times of oppression inside of your heart today, I just want you to say, yes, Lord, I believe. If you believe that all of these things can just prove and make you better and so you're not going to run from the dealings of God, say, yes, Lord, I abide. Yes, Lord, I abide. And if you...